The woman said, well, I, I know who you are. I know about the center. I came to visit uh, the center before it was the center when it was getting started. And uh, it was very interesting. It was meeting in an old ramshackle house near UNCG. <laughs> and my wife Judy said, yeah, that's where we live. <laughs> first started with the AmeriCorps project and some of the others, there was no room on campus. So it was my living room that was our, the office. We had as many as nine people working out of the front part of my house for, for a few years until we finally were able to secure some space through the UNCG network. I'm Raleigh Bailey. I'm was the founding director of the Center for New North Carolinians. I'm retired. I'm director emeritus for the center now. I've been involved with the CNNC since it started, which is officially 2001, but some of the programs of the center go back to 1994. In the mid to late 90s, Chancellor Patricia Sullivan, recognizing there are a lot of changing demographics in North Carolina, pulled together a task force on new North Carolinians and how should UNCG respond to it. And a task force over a year or so decided that UNCG should establish a center. And what I was doing uh, with immigrants and refugees is that I was directing a cluster of programs housed in the social work department. But, and the main one was actually called the AmeriCorps Cross-Cultural Education Service Systems, AmeriCorps Access. And people would give a year of service, kind of like the Peace Corps, to help immigrants and refugees in North Carolina. Then we added a couple more programs, the Immigrant Health Access Project, helping people gain access to health care, an interpreter access project. So at the time that the center started, I was directing all of those programs together. That became the center. CNNC is the Center for New North Carolinians part of UNCG in the Office of Research. We're a university-wide center that facilitates direct service and research related to refugees and immigrants, particularly in North Carolina. A lot of newcomers do not know how to access human services or they're not eligible for services, so we try and fill that gap. And we also are collecting a lot of research information on newcomer populations so we can adequately work with them because some groups are coming in and not much is known culturally about them nor do they know they certainly don't know how our, our systems work so it's actually a two-way education both for the populations that are served but also for the students and faculty that are involved with them my name is holly sinkowitz i'm the director here at the center for new north carolinians so we, we do a lot, but the main areas we help um, immigrants and refugees connect um, access care through, through integration. So we really help connect them with health services, social services, education, um, and other types of, of support, employment as well. So really connecting youth with the school system, getting them caught up in school, um, and then with adults, yeah, really connecting them to social services. So we are unique in that we can serve immigrants and refugees. We really fill in the gaps where other service providers leave off. So for instance, refugees coming in to North Carolina, being resettled, have services for 90 days, sometimes longer. After that, the resettlement agency really isn't allowed to work with them after that point. So we come in at that point in time and make sure that they're still connected to, to services and to care. Um, so we're unique in that we can serve clients a lot longer than other agencies. Currently, the last week I checked, we serve clients from 32 different countries. So the largest groups right now 
are uh, refugees from Burma and from Bhutan who are speaking Nepali. We also serve a lot of Congolese. Um, about half of our population serve our Spanish-speaking immigrants, so a lot from Mexico, Honduras, El Salvador, and Guatemala are kind of the main areas. Um, Somali, Sudanese refugees, really all over the world. The Montagnards from Vietnam, we have served a lot of, of Montagnards and continue to serve a lot of Montagnards. The Montagnards are, are a very special group in North Carolina. Well, even if, if they were somewhere else, they still would be a special group. They are tribal peoples from the highlands of Vietnam. They would make the point that they are not the same as the ethnic Vietnamese. They were the, the aboriginal peoples, kind of like the American Indians, but they were in Vietnam. When the U.S. got involved with the Vietnam War, the U.S. Army recruited the Montagnards to be the frontline fighters because a lot of the fighting was happening in their territory up in the highlands where the Ho Chi Minh Trail was. Actually, this is a very poignant story that not everybody knows, but when it was clear that the U.S. Was, has, was pulling out and that the South Vietnamese government was about to fall, there was a meeting at the U.S. Embassy in Saigon. And I've talked to two different Montagnards who were at the meeting. It was U.S. administrative personnel, U.S. Army, South Vietnamese government, and two Montagnards who were representing the Montagnard peoples. And the U.S. said, we're leaving, you know, we wish you well. We know that the North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong are about to conquer Saigon. And the Montagnard said, well, what, what are we going to do? We're, we're going to be primary targets. And I've read the minutes, and up at that point, the minutes stop. And what both of these guys told me independently is that the U.S. representatives said, keep fighting, and we will support you. And so the Montagnards fighters at least fled into the jungle and start continued guerrilla warfare. This is 1975. And we forgot about it. You know, nobody thought about them anymore, very particularly. And then in 1986, the U.S. Embassy in, uh, in Bangkok, Thailand, got a message that had been handwritten, sent to them from the border, saying, uh, we're out of ammunition and we don't know what to do. Well, at first they tried to ignore this message. But then some advocates heard about it and some Vietnam vets who felt like their lives had been saved by the mountain yards brought, out, brought it to bear and State Department acknowledged that, you know, that the mountain yards are victims because of the U.S. And so they decided that they would resettle them as a special group. And North Carolina had had good experience, especially with Cambodians a few years earlier when there weren't any Cambodians in the U.S. And at that time, I was directing the Refugee Resettlement Program for Lutheran Family Services. So my counterpart on the national level contacted me and said, would North Carolina like to resettle the Montagnards? So they came as a group. Now, this is back in 1987. It's only 220 people. But then they you know, petitioned to bring their families, and then they had babies. More Montagnards got uh, released from re-education camps and the population grew and grew. And then in 1992, something else happened that was important. There was finally a peace settlement in Cambodia. The, the war ended there much later. And the United Nations went in with a, some troops to pacify the area to ensure the peace. And they sent word back, they, a group that had been put on the near the Vietnamese border up in the jungle. They said, there's a group here that don't speak Khmer, the Cambodian language. Who are they? We don't know what we're supposed to do with them. Well, it turned out they were Montagnards. Still thinking they're fighting for the U.S. Army. This is now 1992. You know, we left, we abandoned them in 1975. So they came as a group of 400 and something. And the process continued again. They petitioned for their family members. More Montagnards got released from camps. Some Montagnards were doing well enough that they could petition for family members to come as immigrants. You have to be able to pay all their expenses if they come as immigrants. And so it continued. And then one more time, this story was a little bit different, but in 2000, uh, the, uh, some UN observers were up near the Cambodia-Vietnam border and they saw uh, 
about a thousand villagers flee from Cambodia being chased by Vietnamese soldiers. And they, you know, they, they, were, being, they were subject to being killed. And um, so they automatically got refugee status. So that was another thousand. But that population grew, and now we, we don't know how many people there are, because we're in the third generation. There are um, maybe 15,000 different uh, leaders give different numbers. The way the Hmong, when they were, when they were pre-literate, they conveyed their history through their needlework. And they are coming across as refugees going across the Mekong River, which is a mile or two across there. So it's treacherous journey. Some had boats, some had inner tubes, some just tried to swim. Well, my name is Juan Rodriguez. I am the Mayakoa Access Project Director. Um, I've been in this position since 2004. With the Mayakoa Access Project, we serve immigrants and refugees. We're the only programs, program in the state of North Carolina that targets to serve immigrants and refugees. So our members are placed with nonprofit organizations and that's where they perform community service. They, they um, do different things depending on their, what we call a service description, AmeriCorps term, but it's layman's terms, a job description. Some of the things that they're doing, AmeriCorps members, are helping immigrants and refugees to find employment, um, helping them coaching them to become marketable in the workforce and how to retain the job once they get them, teaching uh, ESOL so that they can also acquire the language which is highly needed, you know, to be, um, well, marketable in the, in the job force. Respect. Respect of the etiquette of that culture. Just because you've been American all your life doesn't make it right. There are others coming in with a way of life that believe they are right. So there's a need to respect it and not try to change it, but to adapt and keep it safe. Uh, the question, what have I learned from my work? Well, I've really enjoyed it. I mean, I've been doing this even before the center, really for about over 30 years I've been working in cross-cultural environments. And I've just learned that everybody is different and everybody's the same. If we can just work together a bit more and try and communicate and you know find common ground. I think that's what I've learned. You know, that's what my goal would be to get people to to get along and support each other. I hope it will be statewide in the counties with large um, refugees coming in, uh, large populations of refugees. So I would like us to, to be expanded for sure. Um, other people have said that too, so I'm like, we just need to make this happen. But um, our center is so unique and people are finally be kind of beginning to realize that we're a resource. and. You know, we regularly get calls from Durham and Raleigh and Chapel Hill, Winston-Salem as well, So, but we're not there. We can only do so much in those locations. So I wish we had offices in more, uh, more counties. Well, you know, it's important to have a lot of organizations to help newcomers, because they're coming in, but they don't always know the language, they don't know the rules, they don't have easy access to health care. And now, a lot of people that are here just don't have anybody to turn to. So organizations like the center, and there are several different organizations that help newcomers. And that's extremely important. And that's what we need to preserve.